Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we are doing another serial killer deep dive and this one was suggested in the comments by one of you guys. I tried to find exactly who said it but I could not so just let me know in the comment section. We're also doing a little merch giveaway, there will be more on that at the end of the video, stay tuned. But with that being said, let's get into it. In the early 2000s, the media in Mexico City began reporting a strange string of murders that followed a similar pattern. Women living alone over the age of 60 were being found robbed and murdered in their homes, primarily by strangulation. The crimes baffled the police, who was targeting the grandmothers of Mexico City. By 2003, 24 older women had been murdered. The media started to speculate it was a serial killer given the unknown attacker the moniker El Matavijitas, or the Old Lady Killer. Law enforcement scrambled to keep up with the killer. For many years, detectives dismissed the idea of a serial killer that was preying on older women. But with the death of Maria de los Angeles Reper on October 18, 2005, the Mexico City Police started to take the case seriously. The police in Mexico didn't have a lot of experience investigating serial killers, Serial killers in the past had been identified as such after their capture. Detectives relied heavily on international experts for their investigation. The Deputy Attorney for Central Preliminary Investigations, Renato Sales Heredia, announced that there was enough evidence to support the theory that there was a serial killer at work. A 100-person team was dispatched to look into the case, led by Guillermo Zayas, who was notoriously known as the Homicide Prosecutor. It would be the largest manhunt ever undertaken in Mexico. Using evidence from the crime scenes and the victims involved, they were able to establish a modus operandi, or MO. The victims had been older women, they were all over the age of 60, many lived alone in middle-class neighborhoods and usually were located near parks. There was never any sign of forced entry into the homes, and the attacks happened during the day, and the victims were robbed of cash and jewelry. Heredia told the public that they thought that there could be an accomplice, as described by a witness from the last murder, although an accomplice was never confirmed. Despite police recognizing the severity of the investigation, there was little movement made in the case. The investigators were able to establish the method by which the murders were being done, but little evidence about the identity of the murderer could be found. One small clue they did find about the identity was a possible written description taken in 2003 from one of the potential cases before it was recognized as part of the string of killings. Due to the strength needed to strangle someone to death, the police speculated that the person they were looking for was a man. They also believed that the killer was posing as some kind of official in order to gain access to the women's home, such as a medical professional or government worker. With little to go on, the murders continued as investigators scrambled to piece together whatever evidence they could. With the murders being officially investigated, people became warier and eventually the police were able to collect some eyewitness reports that gave more information about the previous incidences from 2003. With these first-hand accounts, the police were able to create an artist's rendition as well as a plasticine bust of the suspect. The witnesses had stated that they had seen a robust and manly looking person leaving the victim's homes. The killer was also described as possibly wearing a wig and being quite tall. These descriptions convinced authorities to think that the murderer was a man dressed in women's clothing. The descriptions and renditions were released and then dispersed to police stations throughout the city's 70 sectors. The police also used these sketches to create brochures and posters that were dispersed to the public. Hundreds of tips flooded in with reports of people having similarities to the sketches and law enforcement interviewed over 300 people, but all were released. The killer was often compared to Terry Poulin or the Monster of Montmartre. In 1987, Terry was arrested and convicted in Paris for the killings of over 20 elderly women. Similar to the unknown tacker in Mexico, there hadn't been any sexual nature to Terry's crimes. Terry was motivated by money. The young man was HIV positive and addicted to drugs. He had murdered the elderly women and robbed them and used the money to throw lavish parties 
Knowing he didn't have long to live, he spared no expense on an extravagant lifestyle paid for by the stolen credit cards of his victims. He was arrested when an officer recognized him from a surviving victim's description. Upon his arrest, he confessed to everything, and Terry died in prison before his trial. Terry had dressed as a nurse and targeted elderly women. Police in Mexico believed El Matavijitas was also a male serial killer who was dressing as a nurse or some other profession that would elicit trust from the victims. Mexican police therefore modeled sketches after Thierry based solely on similarities in victims. Due to the comparison to Thierry, police in Mexico began to round up hundreds of people in the LGBTQ community, many of whom were sex workers. Each was interrogated, fingerprinted, and released when it was determined that they didn't match the unknown suspect. The police had also been able to collect a set of fingerprints that matched at nine of the crime scenes, as well as a shoe print from one of the recent crime scenes to use for comparison. The case continued, but police were only able to piece together a few other facts and a few more pieces of random evidence that led them nowhere. The fingerprints were sent off to a national public security system, but no matches were found. The majority of cases took place in Cuatamoc and Benito Juarez, although there were cases in eight other boroughs which made narrowing a location difficult. Police also started to surveil parks and gardens, believing that the murderer was picking their victims while they were out on walks. It was also rumored that the police were paying older women to act as decoys in the parks to lure the murderer out, but this was denied by officials. At one point, it was thought that there might be a connection to the painting Boy in the Red Waistcoat by Jean-Baptiste Scruez, as three victims that were killed close to each other in time owned a copy of the painting. The police also admitted later that it could have just been a coincidence. Investigators also attempted to fingerprint bodies in the morgue to see if they matched those at the crime scenes, thinking that the killer may have committed suicide. They found no print matches, and it was obvious that they were starting to run out of avenues of investigation. Investigators were able to discover that the murders primarily took place on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, helping them to narrow down the habits of their suspect. It was also found that the murderer was often spotted wearing red or dressed as a nurse, further supporting the police's theory that Alma de Vijitas was acting as a medical officer offering benefits or services to gain the trust of these women. On January 10th, 2006, Oliver Guzman Lopez was brought into custody as a possible accomplice while also being held for attempted robbery of an older woman. He was under house arrest while his testimony was being reviewed. It wouldn't be until January 25th, 2006 that the true killer was finally found. Returning home, a man who was renting a room from 82-year-old Ana Maria de los Reyes was surprised to see a woman fleeing from his landlady's home. Upon further investigation, he found that Ana Maria had been strangled to death. He quickly called the police and chased after her. The police caught the suspect and were extremely surprised at what they unveiled. The serial killer was in fact a woman, by the name of Juana Braza. Although the police had believed up to this point that the serial killer had been a man, the combination of eyewitness details and her likeness to the artist's renditions they had secured led police to believe it could be her. They immediately took her into custody as they further investigated. When Juana was arrested, it was discovered that she had paperwork for medical benefits, a social worker ID card, and a stethoscope in her possession, despite not being a social worker or a healthcare worker. She confessed to the murder of Ana Maria de los Reyes, and a media frenzy blew up around her. Video clips of her interrogation, and photos of her and authorities at the scene of the crime were leaked before she was even fully remanded in custody. During this time, Oliver Guzman Lopez was found to have no relation to Juana and was released. According to the police, Juana would cruise public spaces such as gardens and parks, watching for older women who seemed to be alone, and then she would employ a few different methods of gaining access into their homes. It was also discovered that Juana had suffered a back injury during Lucha Libra and had been having issues recovering. The injury had been preventing her from competing as often as she needed to to make enough money for her family. She had turned to shoplifting and breaking into homes to keep up with bills. 
but it still wasn't enough, so she started targeting seniors. One of these methods was offering to help with groceries of those walking home from the store, and then as they talked, offering to do housework for these older women. Also, as previously theorized by police, she would go to women's homes with medical papers, an ID card, and a stethoscope while pretending to be a social worker offering free checkups in order to discuss and provide pension benefits. In the case of Anna Maria, Juana had just gone up to her and asked for a glass of water, after which Anna Maria had invited her in. She would then usually strangle her victims using a variety of items, including tights, phone cables, cords to household appliances, and the stethoscope. Juana would then rob the place, taking small trophies while there, such as ornaments and religious objects. Juana dressed very conservatively and had a neat, short cropped hair. Because of her appearance, she was able to move around the city freely without any concerns of suspicion, as the police had put out a call for a suspect that was male. The possibility that a suspect was a woman had completely contradicted everything they had assembled in their investigation. Since citizens were given this information, Juana had little to worry about as she continued to target these older women, gaining access to their homes. Soy la señora Juana Barraza Samperi. Ruda o técnica. Ruda de corazón. ¿Y dónde es más ruda? Aquí o en casa? Ah, pues en los dos lados. Juana had even appeared on national television in the weeks before her capture. She was being interviewed for a lucha libre event, although the program was broadcasted on national TV. No one, not the police or news media or members of the public, identified Braza as appearing very similar to the sketches. Yet, when she was arrested, police officials praised the hard work of all officers involved, dismissing that it had been kind of a fluke of good timing that had led to her capture. The media relished comparing Braza to the composite image models to reflect the killer, particularly the clay bust. Despite evidence tying her to the scene of the other murders, she only ever admitted to the murder of Ana Maria de los Reyes. When asked why she committed so many killings, all she would say is that she had gotten angry. Some claim that she killed the victims because she needed money, as someone with a history of theft from their victims. During one of their interviews, she was asked, Is it bad what you did? Barraza answered, Yes, it's bad what I did, because no one has the right to take the life of someone else. Barraza was subjected to numerous psychological evaluations. There had been a strong desire to prove to the people of Mexico that not only was Barraza guilty, but she was predisposed to a violent nature. They needed Barraza to fit the narrative that they had built for the Almante Vijetas to ensure the public that they had the right person. Barraza's home was also on the outskirts of Mexico City in an area known for being a lower-income neighborhood with the usual socioeconomic struggles we see in more impoverished communities. It had high rates of crime and lacked infrastructure, and this was used as further evidence to distance Barraza from the general public. Juana Barraza was a 48-year-old single mother of four who lived in Mexico City. Doing a combination of street vending and miscellaneous housework to support her family, her oldest son had died tragically during a mugging when he was only 12. His attackers had killed him using baseball bats. According to her lawyer, Juana stated that she was proud to say she had kept things going on her own. She is proud of being both a father and mother to her children. Neighbors reported that the family was pleasant and kind. Neighbors and those who knew Juana and her family were shocked to discover that she had been the serial killer because they reported the family as being pleasant and kind. In her free time, Juana was a fan of Lucha Libre, organizing events for small town celebrations, working as a popcorn vendor, and also participating in the amateur circuit. She performed as a Rudo, a wrestler that acts like a bad guy in a match. She went under the name of La Dama del Silencio, or The Lady of Silence. Police asked her about this title, and she stated it was because that she was a quiet person that liked to keep to herself. Juana had also described herself as Rudo to the core. It was because of this hobby that Juana had the needed strength and technique to strangle people to death, as well as giving her a muscular appearance mentioned in many eyewitness reports. Upon further investigation, they also found an altar to Santa Muerte, a folk saint of death. At the time, the figure was associated with criminals and drug runners. 
Still, practices around the saint are becoming much more common and have less of a negative reputation as they are seen as the grandeur of wishes and psychopomp of sorts. However, when she was arrested, it was used as further proof that she was guilty. In the eyes of the police, it was a saint only criminals associated with. Juana Barraza's past is not really confirmed, but according to a few sources and her defense team, she had been born in a village north of Mexico City in the state of Hidalgo in 1956. Juana never learned to read or write and grew up in a tragic situation. Juana's father was allegedly a police officer, who was not in her life for long before her mother started seeing another man. Her mother was reported to be an alcoholic sex worker and was both neglectful and abusive to Juana. She would allegedly trade Juana to men for alcohol. At the age of 12, Juana was permanently traded to a man, reportedly for three beers. She had been kept as a prisoner for the man, and her mother lied to the rest of the family and claimed that Juana had gone off to start a new life with him of her own free will. Eventually, she was found and rescued by her uncles when she was 17. She then moved to Mexico City to start a new life. Juana was illiterate and forever resented her mother for the abuses she had suffered as a child. Her mother died when she was 20 years old due to alcoholism. It is due to this past that many believe that she was compelled to commit this murder spree later on. It even had been speculated that Juana's attacks were based on suppressed resentment towards her mother and the treatments she had received. Juana's mother had already passed away by the time of the murders, so through her heinous actions, Juana could live out the revenge that she was never able to get while her mother was alive, and this was a fact that was confirmed at her trial when she told the court, I got angry, I killed old ladies because my mother mistreated me, bit me, cursed at me, and sold me to an old man. In the spring of 2008, Juana Barraza was sentenced to 759 years in jail for at least 11 of the murders that authorities could find solid enough evidence for. This was the longest prison sentence that officials had given in Mexico City history. With that being said, it is suspected that she had killed up to 40 people going as far back as the late 90s. Juana is expected to serve about 50 years as under Mexican law, you can serve your sentences concurrently. She is now 64 years old and still has a long way to go in her sentence. She has had no further incidences in jail, and she has rarely given interviews to the media. Juana Barraza has since become a folk figure under her moniker, La Matapijitas, appearing in television programs based on her story, having a Criminal Minds episode inspired by her, and having multiple songs and ballads written about her. Well, that is it for this video, now let's talk about the giveaway. I have a couple extra pieces of merch and I thought we would just give them away for you guys. It is a unisex XL zip up hoodie in black with the TCM logo on it, as well as a let's get into it sticker and a TCM logo sticker. If you would like to win this merch package, all you have to do is be subscribed to the channel, like and comment on this video, and I will make the announcement over on Instagram by the end of the month. So follow me over there as well. I am at True Crime Mysteries, and then the winner can DM me on Instagram to give me their address. This giveaway is open worldwide. Thank you all so much and good luck to all those who enter.